there is a little bit of a distortion and even a confusion in our thinking on prayer. Let me tell you what I, what, what I think is important for us to understand as we jump into this sixth message in this series, Because You Prayed. The misconception or distortion is this. We think this. What does it cost me? What does it cost me to pray? When really what we should be thinking is what did it cost God for you to pray? Let, and because when I speak a message on prayer, all you're going like, oh, he's asking for an hour, 30 minutes. He's asking us to join the team. He's asking us to pray. Do you understand today? I, I just, I had this, this hit me so hard on Friday of what did it cost God for you to pray? Folks, listen to me. Jesus had to die to open up the door of heaven for you to pray. Do you understand? The, the opportunity you have to pray comes because of Jesus' death on the cross. Listen out of the paraphrase version, Hebrews chapter 10. This will make it real. It, the writer says, and now we are brothers and sisters in God's family because of the blood of Jesus. And he welcomes us to come right into the most holy sanctuary in the heavenly realm boldly and with no hesitation. Now here it comes, church. Listen to verse 20. For he has dedicated a new life-giving way for us to approach God. For just as the veil, that's Old Testament, was torn in two, Jesus' body was torn open to give us free and fresh access to God. That's a great place to say hallelujah. Look at that again. His body was torn open to give us a fresh and free access to God. Folks, that's incredible. What it cost me, please. What it cost God for us to be able to pray. We should worship. We should fall on our knees. We should praise him and say, thank you, God, that I can come boldly and without hesitation into the presence of the almighty God. That, to me, I just, I, I started reading this, this verse and my hands just went up and I just said, thank you, God, for giving us the opportunity to pray. We can pray because Jesus died on the cross. We can pray because of his sacrifice. What it cost me is not the issue, but what it cost God reminds me of the great blessing of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what opened up the door. I, I started thinking about that and I was singing that great, great hymn. I don't know if you remember this hymn. It just goes, down at the cross, where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood. And then I lifted my hands and said, glory to his, how many know that song? And it goes, glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to... How about this one? And it goes like this. Oh, precious fountain that saves from sin. I am so glad I have then turned in. There you see, there Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory, glory to... Oh, you know it now. Come on, glory. Sing it now. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Come on, sing it. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. 
Cast thy poor soul at the safe, your feet plunge in. Sing it, church. Come on, let us hear you online. Sing it. Glory to. Come on, church. There to my heart. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The cross opens the door to prayer. The death of Christ was my access. I go to the Father because of the Son. This is the verse sometimes I know I forget to quote the whole thing. You know the verse. It goes like this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And finish the rest of it. What's those two words? No one comes to the Father but through me. Hallelujah. Let me be clear. No one gets to God unless you go through Jesus Christ. Folks, I know that's not very ecumenical, but it's very biblical. You can't get to God the Father unless you have Jesus to get you there. Oh, I know it's going to offend some of you, but listen, we're already at message number six, and I haven't even said enough that I don't care. But let me just tell you this right now. It's the only way you can get to God. It's not through a priest, a mosque, or a synagogue. It's not through Times Square Church, us. It's not through anything else. You can't say I'm a Methodist, Baptist, or Presbyterian. You can't even say I'm Puerto Rican. You've got to begin to say, I know Jesus, and Jesus can get me into God's presence. Hallelujah. At the very end of the Civil War, a dejected Confederate soldier was sitting outside the grounds of the White House. It was a time when people can wait at the White House property and wait to go in to see the president. Forget that today. A young boy approached this downcast Confederate soldier and asked him why he was so sad. And the soldier said he had repeatedly tried to see President Lincoln and he wanted to tell the president that his farm in the south was unfairly taken away by the federal soldiers but each time he tried he said to enter the White House he said the guards would cross their bayoneted guns in front of the doors and turn him away and he sat there on that bench and the boy motioned to the soldier and said follow me and when they approached the guarded entrance all of a sudden Out of a surprise, the soldiers came to attention, stepped back, and all of a sudden their their guns came down to their sides and the boy proceeded not just past the guards but right into the library where the president was resting and introduced the soldier to his father. The soldier was absolutely amazed but didn't realize that that boy was Tad Lincoln, the son of the President of the United States. The soldier was able to gain access through the President's son. Let me put it another way. The man didn't have a chance to see the most powerful man on the planet unless the son of the most powerful man brought him in. Folks, or let me put it to you another way. You want to see God in heaven? You can't get there unless you take the hand of Jesus, the Son of God, and He's the one that can walk you straight through, get you to heaven today. Oh, I know it's the beginning of the message, but I'm already excited because Christianity doesn't work without Christ. Religion doesn't work unless you have Jesus. Heaven is too far, too long, too hard to get there on your own strength. That's why Jesus came. You couldn't make it to eternity without help. 
You can't make it in life without help. Grab hold of Jesus today and you can be set free. Plunge into that fountain today and you can be made complete. You can be clean. You can know today I'm forgiven and I'm forever going to heaven today in Jesus' name. So why not stop right now and see if you have to be born again? Why not stop right now? How much more do you need? Because you can't get to heaven unless you are laid hold of Jesus today. If you're watching in the balcony, the annex, the main floor around the country and around the world, this is the moment. You don't need music. Some of you are going like, that's why we sign off at the very end when he gets to the ABCs. I fooled you today. I'm asking you to plunge in and be made complete today. Today. Listen, you can't get to heaven without Jesus. You can't get forgiven without Jesus. I don't care if you're a Jew or a Muslim. I don't care if you're a Catholic or a Presbyterian. I'm here to tell you he has come to set you free. You can't, Times Square Church can't get you to heaven. We can't get you there, but Jesus can. He's got to come in and change you. He's got to come into your heart. So why not stop right here and just simply say, some of you are going like, you can't do it in the beginning of the message. I can't. The Holy Spirit can. And so if you're sitting here today in this place, we're going to pray a prayer that says, Christ, come into my life and change me. I've been trying to get to heaven on my own, and the sun is right there in front of me. And today, all you need to do is grab hold of the Son of God and be able to walk right into the presence of God. You can't get to God without Jesus. You can't get to heaven without Jesus. You can't be forgiven without Jesus. You can't pray without Jesus. So let's get Jesus in our lives today. Oh, you can keep your heads up and your eyes open. It doesn't matter right now. Whether you're watching from the Middle East or Africa, whether you're watching from Latin America, or whether you're watching from California, Michigan, or Iowa, it doesn't matter. We need Christ today. I'm going to pray that prayer that grabs hold of the hand of Jesus. I'm going to pray that prayer that says, I want to be born again. I want him in my life. I admit that I'm a sinner, that I'm broken on the inside. I can't fix myself. And I want to believe that God sent his son 2,000 years ago to die for me on the cross to become my sin bearer. And I want to confess him as Lord today and say, you're in charge of my life. You're not in charge on Sundays for an hour or two. You're in charge every single day. I need you to hold my hand, Jesus. I need you to come into my life. I need Christ today. If you're sitting there right now and say, Pastor Tim, when we pray this prayer, I want to be part of it. I want Christ in my life. I want to be born again and with everybody looking around, everybody in this place. And you'd say, put me in that prayer today. I know I need Christ in my life. Hold up your hand as high as you can. Hold it up as high as you can. Yes, 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 yes. All of those. Yes, 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 yes. Keep them up right now. Balcony. Yes, 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 yes. Got you there, 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 there. Over there, thank you, God. Can we all pray this together? Come on, let's say this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me, so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. The Bible is my guide. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah the most important decision you can make if you're online you'll have opportunities at the end to hit a link that will join you with people and if you're here you can do everything um, from just going over to exit seven at the very end 
or texting decided. We'll get all that to you at the very end. All right, back to the message. (laughs) Wherever Jesus is present, satanic activity is sure to come. When the presence of Jesus is moving, you can expect the moving of hell. When there are focused times of, on Christ in prayer and fasting, it should be no surprise that that's usually the heat of the battle. Jesus was teaching in the synagogue in Mark chapter 1, and there was a demonic manifestation while Jesus is teaching. I've been in these situations many times. When we first came into ministry, especially when we were pastoring in the Midwest, in the inner city, it was happening almost monthly. It was as if that the presence of God was poking a stick in a snake nest. And we saw people slithering in the aisles. We've seen demoniacs sent there on assignment to kill me and other staff people. I've seen supernatural demonic strength of fists. I watched it hitting metal, metal lockers and putting fist prints with no even thought of pain, putting holes in walls, but when they came and approached me or any of our staff, it was as if the blood of Jesus was a shield against us. I've watched it, I've experienced it. When Jesus shows shows up, so do devils. Listen to it. They went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and began to teach. He was just there to teach the word. They were amazed at his teaching, and for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribe. So you have to remember, he is teaching, and whenever the word is being taught, Jesus is there, the presence of Jesus. This is what happens, verse 23. Just then, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, what business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Is it, it's amazing to me that you see this incredible contrast. Jesus is teaching and Satan is shouting. That's an incredible contrast to me. Because usually people who have no authority usually love to scream and shout. It's theatrics and props. So if you're ever in a conversation and people start screaming, they've given themselves away. They have no authority. It's just theatrics and props. It's an intimidation. That's what this is. Because authority can whisper and there's power. That's why I love Genesis 1. All it is is God said. God said, let there be light. God, he didn't scream it. He didn't shout it. He just said, let there be light. Let there be planets. Let, me, let there be fowls. Let there be, let there be animals created. That's what he does. Authority doesn't need to shout. Authority begins to say, my authority doesn't come from my voice. This is the theatrics of it. So what does Jesus do? Mark 1, and Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. Throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out. Here he goes again, shouting with a loud voice, and it came out of him. They were all amazed as they debated among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Immediately, the news about him spread everywhere into all the surrounding districts of Galilee. Once again, Jesus rebukes a demon, and it leaves with with more yelling. But what I love about this passage is what comes next. And this is where God began to speak to me and encourage me, not only for my life, but I want to encourage you with it. Right after this happens, look at the next verse, verse 29. This is what it says, the very next verse. And immediately, right on the heels of the demonic deliverance, after they came out of the synagogue, they came into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. What Jesus does is he brings deliverance from the demon- to the demonic, and he's about to bring healing to the home. He touches the, he sets the demon, gets rid of this demon, these praise. And this demon leaves, and he's about to enter into the home, and watch what happens. Verse 30, now Simon's mother-in-law was lying sick with a fever, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. And he came to her, raised her up, taking her by the hand. I love this. And the fever left, and she waited on him. This is my message that I, that I think we have to hear today 
in this series on prayer, and that's this. What you see here in these two verses that are so, that are connected back to back is this, that what you see with Jesus is you see demon prayers and fever prayers, and it's learning to pray about everything. It's learning that whether you're praying for someone to be set free from hell or whether it's just simply a 101 degree fever, God hears it and God works miracles in both situations. Look at this. There's, a, there's an important phrase here when Jesus is in the home of Simon Peter. And the Bible says this. It says, and immediately they spoke to Jesus about her. Let me give you that phrase again. They spoke to Jesus about her. That, get this down, that's the definition of what intercession really is. It's you speaking to Jesus about somebody. It's the greatest definition in the Bible that I see of this phrase without trying to complicate it. When you intercede, you're talking to Jesus about people. That is what intercession is. It's taking to Jesus someone else's issues. Let me, let me say this. This is important. There is a fine line between intercession and gossip. Get ready. Intercession talks to Jesus about people's issues. Gossip talks to people about people's issues. Look at that. Leave that on the screen for a moment. Because this is the difference. It, this is the fine line. Both of you have issues with people, but it's who you bring it to determines whether you're an intercessor or a gossip. Whether, whether you're going to see answers. Because the person you're talking to can't fix the situation. But Jesus can. See, here's the thing that I want you to get. I think people who are gossips, and you, and you know who you are. I think people... Who are, you're already texting, going, Pastor Tim's calling us names. You're already doing it. Sure. Instead of talking to Jesus, saying, quiet him up, you're talking to others. You're already texting, going, that's why I don't go to this church, and this is the reason why he's calling us names. Let me just say this. I really think that people who are gossips are, are, are potential intercessors. I really do. I think you're potential intercessors. <laughs> Look at the person next to you. And don't say anything. <laughs> Look at the other person next to you and say, I'm going to bring you to Jesus. Tell them that right now and say, I'm going to bring you to Jesus. It's amazing to me that when Jesus cast out the demons, everybody, the Bible says, was amazed and news spread everywhere. It's also amazing to me is that no one was blown away at the fever except the one who got the fever out of them. Like when the demons are gone, everyone's going like, this is incredible. But when the fever is out, no, nobody's, nobody's standing in public going like, he had 101 temperature and then went down three degrees, let's all clap. Nobody's doing that today. It has to be this demon testimony. But I have to tell you, both of those miracles count. That whether it's a demon deliverance or a fever relief, that is a miracle from heaven. And that's what's so important, that we have to understand Jesus showed back-to-back -back prayer moments. Jesus was telling us the fever prayers and the demon prayers are both important, that we have to understand. If you're in the synagogue, Jesus gives a stern rebuke. In the home, he just simply takes her by the hand. There's a calmness to the miracle of the home no yelling over the spirit of covid it was just simply taking her by the hand and all of a sudden when he took her by the hand the fever broke and she was able to serve again but in the in the synagogue when facing hell it just simply says he looked and said come out demon prayers and fever prayers there's something special here praying for the sick doesn't always have to be the cancer and heart failure, terminal diseases. It can simply be, my stomach's not feeling good. My back's not feeling good. You know what, know what we're commissioning you to do? There should be fever prayers that happen all over the sanctuary. 
As soon as you hear somebody go, hey, I'm not feeling good today. Ooh, fever prayer. Come over here. And all of a sudden, you just grab them by the hand and say, God, you can, set, you can deliver them from demons, and you can go ahead and set them free right now. They're all over this place. We need to have this signal with us that if we hear something, it doesn't have to be this giant request. It could be the simplest request that you can, you, can, you can walk in here and go like, I'm upset because there's this half marathon and I couldn't even be here. Okay, that may be a demon prayer. Okay, let me just go ahead and pray this out of you, this demon of anger that seems to come upon you right now over this. Jesus, the closeness of these miracles are both miracles. It's exactly what you would expect of Jesus. That he would take the time with a mother-in-law and he would take the time with a man in the synagogue. He doesn't say, I only do demon possession. Jesus did not say, I only answer big prayer requests and for the little ones, take Tylenol. He didn't say that. He said, no problem. Too small or too big, it's no problem for God. Bring it all to Jesus in prayer. That's really what the challenge is for us. There's a, I want to pause for a second. I read something this week that was profound to me. It was from the writer of C.S. the writer C.S. Lewis, and I started to realize how important this is. Let me just say this, and then I'm going to read to you what he said, and it so struck me, because I truly believe that a prayerless church has fallen in love with what they do, not the one they do it for. Let me say that again. And then I'm going to read to you the challenge from C.S. Lewis. Listen to these words. The prayerless church has fallen in love with what they do. Oh, we do music. Oh, we do choirs. Oh, we do, we do communicating from the... We, we, we do... Folks, let's not fall in love with what we do. Let's stay in love with the one we do it for. L listen to what C.S. Lewis said. This is, the, this is what... It struck me like a, like a wrecking ball. Listen to these words that he wrote. He was speaking to those... That, that, that he grouped them in the, in the category of poets and musicians. I want you to listen, choir, musicians, singers, but I want you to listen as a church. I need to hear this. It's not just them, but he speaks to them. He goes, every poet and musician and artist, listen to this, is drawn away from the love of the thing he tells to the love of the telling till down deep in hell they cannot be interested in God at all, but only in what they say about him. Folks, don't leave it on the screen for just a second because you've got to understand how potent this is. What he was saying was this. We can fall in love with the telling and the singing and the doing, but forget the one we are speaking and singing about and preaching about. It goes for me. It's not an issue of just going like, here's another sermon. Here's another sermon series. I, I don't want to fall out of love with Jesus. I don't want to fall and fall in love with doing ministry. How, how, folks, it is that to me is becoming the danger of the Western church. We have fallen in love with how to do church. And in all of doing church, we have fallen out of love with him. Prayer keeps us in love with Jesus. Because this, this is what I've learned. When you pray, when I think of demon prayers and fever prayers, demons, demon prayers, the deliverance, the, 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 to break hell free off somebody, demon prayers will drive us to prayer. It'll drive us there. It's the, it's the huge things. But fever prayers will always keep us on our knees because they're happening all the time. The fever prayers are the little things, the tiny things. Stay in prayer over these things. Don't just pray when the demonic shows up. Pray when, the, when it's 99 degrees. Pray when there's a headache. Pray when whatever you're facing with. Pray before you get into the city going, I'm coming into the city. Oh God, I need a miracle. There's, there's this moment I've been pondering when the disciples were called upon one of their demon prayers to cast out a demon and they couldn't. Many of you are familiar with this. It says this. Then the disciples came to Jesus, when they tried to cast the demon out of a boy and they couldn't, and then Jesus had to step in and do it. And Jesus said to them, they said to Jesus, why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Don't miss this part. But this kind does not go out except by what? This kind doesn't go out 
by prayer and fasting. So here's what I've been thinking about. When Jesus said this kind does not go out unless you're praying and fasting, that means they were doing something else to get rid of that demon. And in my mind, I'm going, what superstitious religious thing were you doing that Jesus had to come and say, are you out of your mind? That's my version. Are you, you don't cast them out. He says, this only comes out by pr prayer and fasting, which means they weren't praying and fasting. So the question is, what were they doing? What hocus pocus magic were they doing? Let me help you. We don't have church unless we're praying and fasting. We can't experience the power of God unless we're a praying people. We can't sing with power. We can't worship with power unless we're calling upon God every single day. They were powerless people because they were prayerless people. That's the issue. That's what God is calling us to. Now let me close with Philippians 4, 6, and 7 about thinking through this demon prayers and fever prayers. Let me close with these last two passages. Sermon alert. It's a long closing. <laughs> Here we go. It's demon prayers and fever prayers. It's learning to pray about everything. It's learning that whether it's big or small, we bring it all to God. Listen to Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And let me give you just a few thoughts. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about what? Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Tell God your needs, and don't forget to thank him for his answers. If you do this, you'll experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. For all of you old school people, just hold on, I'll get to the King James. Because some of you are going like, I want that peace that passeth. I want passeth in that. I'll get there. Just stay with me in a second, okay? I know, listen, I know you people. I know you people. You're wanting... It says, and his peace will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet. Yes, they will. And at rest as you trust Christ Jesus. A few quick thoughts. Number one, prayerlessness and worry are always connected. Prayerlessness and worry are connected, which means the less you pray the more you will, the less you pray, the more you will worry. Prayer is the prescription for anxiety and the medicine for worry. If your worry levels are up, then check the prayer gauge. If your worry levels are up, check the prayer gauge. What's amazing is when we were in El Salvador and going down there, for this conference and to meet with our child cry partners down there. While we were on the plane going down, I opened up my iPad and was reading on my Kindle. And when you read on the Kindle, you don't use a marker, you can just underline with your finger on the Kindle. Is it an amazing thing to realize with the society that we live in that, that as you are underlining, sometimes you'll come across in books and even the Bible that there is this faint dotted line under what you're about to underline. And what that means is, is that people before you have underlined that. And sometimes it'll say 3126, which means 3,126 people have underlined the very thing you're underlining. And so that's the way Kindle keeps a record of the most underlined verses of books and uh, 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 sentences of books and then Kindle came out just a few years ago with the most underlined passage in the Bible. And before I read it, I put my hand over, over the, 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 the part and I said, I want to guess. And my first guess was Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It wasn't it. Then I said, well, then it must be, it must be that the Lord's prayer, our Father which art in heaven, and that's not right. Then I said, John 3.16, it has to be John 3.16. The most underlined verse on Kindle Bible is Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs and don't forget to thank him for his answers.
Because if you do this, you'll experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet as you rest and as you trust in Christ Jesus. It's as my friend Mark Batterson says, think of worry as a prayer alarm. Every time it goes off, you go right to prayer at that moment. Every time worry seems to come. Why is this the most underlined verse? Because people are trying to get rid of worry without prayer. It's impossible to be be a person that begins to to fight through worry and anxiety. We've got to find ourselves on our knees praying. Whether it's a demon prayer, we're praying for people to be delivered or a fever prayer for people to be healed either way we're believing for God to work miracles today somebody said this one time he says if it's big enough to worry about then it's big enough to pray about that's just simply what it is or let's just take what the reformer Martin Luther said he said pray and let God worry let God take over this thing and let me just tell you God's not worrying about anything he's God's Number two, everything means everything. Paul says, pray about everything. Everything means everything. If the devil is in your house, pray. If someone is running a fever in your house, pray. God answers both prayers. If your marriage is in trouble, pray. If you're, if you're thinking, I'm out of my budget money this week for, for food because we had an unexpected, then pray. Just pray on all those things. Someone once said, I don't bother God with the little things. And they forgot, it's all little to God. What are you talking about? I don't bother him with the little things. I have a friend who is a Major League Baseball scout, and I went with him. He said, come to a game with me one time. And I went to a game and sat in a press box with all the other scouts from all the other baseball teams. And in front of me were these people that are in charge of the MLB app. If you know anything about a Major League Baseball app, you can turn your app on in any game, and in real time, they'll tell you not just the pitch count, where the pitch was in the batter's box, what kind of pitch it was, and how fast the pitch was. And I'm looking in front of me at the guy who was putting it all into the computer that I've, I've watched before, as I've sometimes watched the Yankee, I, you know, you couldn't get a Yankee game, so I'm watching the pitch by pitch, and I'm watching the guy go, fastball, 97 miles an hour, right side of the plate. I'm going, this guy is taking these meaningless pitches. Somebody going like, nothing's meaningless with the Yankees. Okay, just listen for a second. He's taking these meaningless pitches, and he's He's, what he's doing is he is literally beginning to put everything in a list. This direction, this speed, this kind of pitch. And I sat there looking at that going, if this guy knows the details of all that's happening to tell us, I've got to believe there is a God in heaven that's looking down at every single detail of our life and going, I care about the fever. I care about the budget money. I care about what's going on with your child. I care about the problem with your boss. I care about everything that you're about to. Folks, I'm telling you, I believe God is greater than MLB and that God can begin to look at everything. Everything is everything with God. Pray about everything everything number three as you pray about fevers i'm telling you you get faith to fight demons as you pray the small prayers i'm telling you god will show up god did not say when you became born again when you pray that prayer today god didn't say to you glad to meet you see you in heaven he said i'll walk with you every single day he is here with you He is with you, taking you by the hand. Listen to this verse, Colossians 2, 6. And now, just as you trusted Christ to save you, look at this, next step. Trust him to, for what? Each day's problems. Live in vital union with him. He says, just as you trusted him to save you, that's a big prayer, that's a salvation prayer. Trust him with the fever prayers every single day. Trust him with the little things. Why? It keeps me connected to him. It keeps me staying in love with Christ. 
It keeps the love of Christ so, so prevalent to me. Think about that for just a moment. How important this is when you begin to cry out and pray. I was thinking of the painting some years ago when George Frederick Watts painted this interesting picture. I looked at it today when I was thinking about this and it was just simply called Hope. And it's a woman sitting on this rock playing this, playing, it, it looks like a harp or play, not, even, not a harp, but just some type of instrument that has strings on it. And you can't tell if she's in the middle of an ocean or in the middle of a desert. But this is what you can tell. She's sitting there with this instrument and there's one string left. And on the bottom it just simply says hope. And I looked at that and I just said, God, listen, I may be a one string man, but I'm telling you, that one string is always prayer. I will always cry. Listen, when I'm out of strings and I'm out of, well, they don't know who I need to know and I'm in trouble over here and over here. I got one string left. It's called pray to God and ask for a miracle and ask God to show up. So whether I'm facing a demon in my home or a demon in the church, a fever in my home or a fever in the church, listen, I may just be a one string man, but I've got a big one string. Because it's not me who prays, it's the God that listens to me. Or as Max Lucado said, the power of prayer is not the one who prays, but the one who hears that prayer. That's why I'm telling you, I'm a one-string man, but my one string, I'm telling you, can change fevers and get demons just set free from people's lives. And here's my final thought for you as the band comes. Number four, Prayer brings peace to a troubled heart, even though the answer hasn't come yet. Okay, all you old school people, get ready, because I'm going to read King James now. And the peace of God, which, and I know you wanted to hear this word, passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Then God's peace, the, Bible, and the peace of God, no, go back to that other verse, go back to verse seven, because I've got to finish it or I'm gonna get in trouble. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. It's one of these versions says it like this, then God's peace, which goes beyond anything we can imagine, will guard your thoughts. The prayer may not change the thing at that moment, but it can change you so you can live even though the situation hasn't changed yet. There's some days I prayed for the fevers to be broken and the demons to be delivered and it didn't happen right yet. But God still gave a peace in the midst of that. How many know what I'm talking about? Because sometimes you're going to pray and you don't see it. That's why I think that verse is connected. He says, but what you can get, even if the answer doesn't come, you can get a peace that passes understanding. What do you mean, Pastor Tim? Let me tell you this story. This is what it looks like. I was reading the story of Eric Barker, who was a Christian missionary who spent 50 years preaching the gospel in Portugal and leading up all the way, preached for 50 years, all the way up to World War II. And at some point, things became so dangerous in Portugal that Eric was advised to send his wife and eight children back to England on a boat. Yes, I said eight children, and I went, what? As well as his sister and her three children. So Eric Barker loaded 13 people that he treasured most in the the world onto a ship and watched it steam out of sight. His plan was to join the family in England on a later ship that week after concluding his final missionary business after 50 years in Portugal. The Sunday after his family's departure, and it would be his final Sunday before the congregation, except for a telegram he received shortly before the service, the telegram he shared with the congregation. And this is what he told them. He said, I've just received word that all of my family has arrived safely home. The congregation cheered and breathed a sigh of relief 
It was only later that they learned the full meaning of the pastor's words. Safely home didn't mean safely England. Just before the meeting, Barker learned that a German U-boat had torpedoed the ship. There were no survivors. His wife, eight children, and his sister and her three children were all gone. And Barker knew it. And he also knew they were safely home. That's what he knew. They were safely home with the Lord in heaven. How do you preach knowing that you just lost the 13 most important people of your life? How do you stand before a congregation and say, the family is, is safely home? How do you say that? Here it is. There's a peace that passes understanding that people can't even figure out. And everyone's going, you got to grieve, you got to do this. And you're going like, no, 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 no. I have a peace that passes understanding right now that God has done something and he's worked a miracle. The peace that Jesus gives is not just a promise to remove the pain and stress, but it's a peace he offers to be calm, unafraid, unruffled, even though the fever is still lingering. The demon just won't let go, but there's a peace that's there. As the musicians and the singers all come, I want to read this final verse and then, we, then we're done here. There is a strange, stand with me because we're gonna, I'm going to read this to you. There is a strange and deep saying in the book of Psalms. It's only used here once. It's a charge that God levels against his own people. Only used one time. And it literally says this. You limited God. It's the only time it's ever used. You limited me. God says this to them in Psalm 78, verse 41. He said again and again, they tempted God, only time it's used, and limited the Holy One of Israel. One of the versions says again and again, they limited God, look at this next part, preventing Him from blessing them. Limiting God. I just kept saying, God, don't ever let me be in that spot. Don't ever let me be in that place. The psalmist makes this charge. And I, and I think nothing limits God more than a people that won't pray. Than a people that will miss the moment to say, well, we only pray for demons to be set free. No, 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 no. We pray for everything. Everything. It's... When you're going, when the sound's not working for Asher or Juan, it's not going, I, I, we don't know, no, we know what to do. God, give us wisdom right now. Tell us what we need to do. If you're in technology, you're going like, oh, we didn't study this in school. God, give me wisdom. We got to know what's going on. here. We pray about everything. Everything. Before you sing a song, before you do a choir special, before you sing in Spanish, you go, God, I need your anointing. I don't just need Spanish school. I don't just need vocal lessons. I don't just need experience. I need God's anointing. I need the touch of God. It's not a matter of going like, oh, we're doing the song amazing. We've sung this before, so we know, we know what we're doing. No, we don't know anything. Don't limit God what he can do. He can take the song amazing and all of a sudden blow the roof off this deer. And New York City can use a roof blown off once in a while. Don't. Limit God. Don't sit on the keyboards or guitars and going, I, I've done this, I, I know how to play this song. God, help me to play with an anointing. Help me to preach with an anointing. When you walk into this church, don't walk in like you're just going, I've been here for 20 years. I don't care. You need to have the freshness of heaven upon you and say, I need God. Don't limit God. Prayer teams in red don't go, oh, we've been doing this for 10 years. That means nothing. We need faith to pray. We need anointing to pray. We need Jesus to pray. Elders, don't look at this going, I've been an elder for this. We, we as elders, we need the anointing of God. We as pastors need the, don't limit him. 
And the psalmist makes the charge and says, you're limited. When you limit me, you're taking away the blessings that could come. When you limit me, and folks, here's the part that got me. And then the psalmist says, this is the charge against you. You limited God. And then somehow he was almost trying, Ricardo, to shake him up, to shake them up and going, listen, let me help you. Don't limit him. And you know what the psalmist does? Takes the next 15 verses to remind them what God has done in their life. He goes, don't limit me. Don't, don't keep your blessing from me, from, from yourself. And as, as, as if they weren't getting it. As if there was there's something in the blank space that goes, we, we got this. And then all of a sudden it shakes them going, listen to this, listen to it. The next verse, they didn't remember. Listen to the next verses. They didn't remember his power. The day when he redeemed them from the enemy, when he worked his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan, turned the rivers into blood and their streams that they couldn't even drink. He's talking about Egypt. He sent swarms of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs, which destroyed. These are the 10 plagues. He sent crops. He, sent, he gave their crops to the caterpillar, their labor to the locusts. He destroyed their vines with hail and their, and their sycamore tree. It's, it's so easy just to go, well, he did that in the past. God goes, let me remind you what I did and what I can do. He also gave up their cattle to the hail and their flocks to the fiery lightning. That's the fire and hail that came down. He cast them on the fierceness of his anger, wrath, indignation, and trouble by sending the angels of destruction among them. He made a path for his anger. He didn't spare their soul from death, but gave their life over to the plague. He destroyed the firstborn of Egypt, the first of their strength and the tents of Ham. But he made his own people go forth like a sheep. He says, I guided them in the wilderness like a flock. And when they didn't know what to do, I led them on safely. They, so they didn't fear. When the ocean was in their way, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies, I brought them through this holy border. This mountain, which is his right hand, had acquired. I drove out the nations before them, allotted them an inheritance by sir. I made the tribes of Israel dwell in their tents, and yet they tested and provoked the Most High God. Don't limit God. I kept saying, what would your 15 verses say? What would my 15 verses say? I healed you. I delivered you. I set you free. I gave you a job. I gave you a child. I touched your mind. I opened up a door. I did all this. What would God remind us that he has done in our life? God has done great things. Don't limit God. Stop limiting him today pray stop limiting him pray stop limiting him pray 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 stop limiting him El Salvador stop limiting him Philippines stop limiting him South Africa come on pastors pray leaders pray worship leaders pray single moms pray Wall Street pray lawyers pray Actors pray, athletes pray, ambassadors pray, NYPD pray, fire department pray, pray. He has done great things, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 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 I want to close with that song, My God, My God, I Need You, that song, I Need You Now. If you're here today as we just sing this and you're going, Pastor Tim, I've limited him. But today is a day I start with remembering all that he's done. I will not limit him anymore. Whether I'm praying for people to be set free from demons or, or, or fevers to be broken. If you're here today and say, 
I've, how many would say that? I've been limiting him. Raise your hand. Just hold it up. At balcony, how many would say I've been? As we sing this, I want you to get out of your seat and walk down here quickly. Just get out of your seat and walk down. If you're saying, this is the day that we break through. Let's sing that. My God, my God. Come on. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God. I'd be with you. I just, I don't want to limit him anymore. I don't want to limit him anymore. I, so whether it's a, a demon prayer or a fever prayer, I'm going to drop to my knees and pray every single time. Every single time. And that's what we're asking. We're saying, and what we sometimes need, we just need someone just to shake us a little bit and just to go, do you remember what he's done? Do you remember what he's done? Do you remember? How many... Here at this altar would go, he's done a lot for me. He's done a lot for me. So can we do this just for the next, for the next 30 seconds? We're going to not only lift our hands, but we're going to open our mouths. And I want you to thank, just, I want you to do your 15 verses before God. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, God. You gave me a job. Thank you that we ate food today. Thank you that we haven't. Go ahead. Open up your, lift your hands and open your mouth. And come on. You go, don't let God tell you your 15 verses. You tell him. Come on, choir. Come on, musicians. Come on. Let's go. Just tell him. Thank him. Thank him what he's done. I thank you for my children. I thank you for health. I thank you for a place to live. I thank you for food. I thank you, Lord God, that you've been so faithful to us. Come on, you tell him. Give him your 15 verses. Give him those 15 verses. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You've been so good. You've opened up doors that I couldn't even have opened up. You've opened up opportunities. Whether it be on Broadway or sports, whether it's been whether it's been in an apartment, whether I got in a lottery apartment, I thank you that I got a cheap lottery apartment that I couldn't even afford. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Thank you for your faithfulness, oh God. You're so faithful to us. God, I'm asking you right now that I would just always remember what you've done. I never want to limit you. Don't let us have a church. Come on, those that are watching around the country, maybe those that are listening throughout the week. Come on, if you're a leader, if you're a pastor, if you're a musician, a worship leader, you go ahead. Give him your 15 verses. Give him your 15 verses and say, I will not limit him. Come on, NYPD, thank him that you're, you're living. Thank you that he's protected you. Come on, firemen, thank him that he has protected you. He has protected you. He has guarded your family. He's guarded your family. Thank God. Doctors, thank him, thank him, thank him for the opportunity to be in school. Thank him. Thank him for students that you have a way into a university. Thank him right now. Thank him right now. 15 verses. Come on, open up your mouths and thank him for just a moment. Around the country, thank him. Thank him, California. Thank him, Texas. Thank him, Florida. Come on, Florida. Lift your hands and praise him in that living room. Come on, right now, Connecticut, New Jersey. Come on, New Jersey campus. Just go ahead and praise him. Praise him, Pennsylvania. Praise him, Puerto Rico. Praise him, Guam. Praise Him, Navajo Nation. Praise Him today, Nicaragua. Praise Him, South Africa. Praise Him, Botswana. We bless you. We bless you. We will not limit God. We will not limit God. Oh, we bless your name. We bless your name. We bless your name. Just before we sing this at chorus one more time with Ricardo and the team. Let's make a commitment. 
that we're not going to fall in love with doing church. Let's make a commitment we're not going to fall in love with doing choir and doing music. Let's make a commitment we're not going to fall in love with doing 212 and TSC Kids. And a, we're, we're going to stay in love with the one we do it for. With the one that we do it for. Because when you don't, list, leaders, listen to me, and you may be visiting. When you don't, you end up with hocus pocus stuff. That's what they were doing. When Jesus had to go, you, these don't come out except by prayer and fasting. Remember? What were they doing? Like, what, what are they doing? Like, certain hand moments? Like, let's go. Like, what were you, like, what are you doing? Like, what are you, what are you doing? You have, a, you have a boy that needs to be set free, and you're, and you're doing something, but you're not praying and fasting. When you don't pray and fast, you end up with hocus pocus. When you're not praying and fasting, you end up with the nonsense that's happening in the Western church. It's nonsense. Look at me. It's nonsense. Oh, I don't know if you should say that. Okay, here we go. It's nonsense. It's nonsense. Here it is. Here it comes. Ah, oh, why not? Here we go. Keep it online. When you're not praying, you need theater. When you don't pray, you need theater. Broadway has theater because they don't have the Holy Spirit. That's okay. That's okay. I expect that. But I don't, I don't need Lion King for the resurrection of Jesus. It's enough for us. It's enough for us. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sending this. Send it to whoever you want. We're, we're going to pray and let God do the rest. Let's sing this in close. Let's sing this in close. Oh, God.